Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you, Skip, for that. Thank the local chapter for helping. Uh, I think this is almost a two-year process um, of suggestions and, and getting the timing right. So we really appreciate all the work that went into this. So instead of me reading um, Shan's bio, we're just going to do a little conversation, and then we'll open it up for questions and hope that we'll have a good conversation. So thanks, Shan, for coming. We appreciate it. Um, I like to start all these, they're talking about where you grew up. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I grew up in upstate New York in a town called Rochester. Um, actually moved all over the country. My dad was not in the military. He worked for Xerox. And so uh, we lived in California, and we lived in New York, and we lived in Texas. And I went to school in Missouri and spent most of my adulthood in the Midwest. But I have to say, having traveled so much has really helped me in this role at Founding Moms. What did you want to be? What did I want to be? You know, I grew up in the 70s when we were still on the bubble of uh, what we could be. Um, I hadn't been issued my woman card at that point. And, uh, you know, I, I was the first woman on my maternal side of the family to go to college. And I think what I thought I was going to be was an investigative journalist. And what I ended up being was in communications and public relations. And I actually worked for Governor Carnahan, the late Governor Carnahan in Missouri, and uh, then did public relations work for Fortune 500 companies. But I decided to stay home. I have five kids, and as you moms know, they get into trouble the most when they're in middle school. So I thought, well, I'll stay home for a while. And uh, I had been a stay-at-home mom for about five years when Sandy Hook happened and changed my life. What? Is the difference for you between the private, you worked in the private sector as, as well as the public sector right out of college. And so it's, I wanted you to kind of touch on that um, first of kind of the differences that you experienced while doing public relation work. Well, you know, it's interesting um, working for a government organization, working for Governor Carnahan, working in public relations to write speeches for legislators, you kind of see the sausage being made. Uh, it's not always pretty sausage, and uh, it's kind of better to see the end product. But at the same time, it gave me a lot of insight as to how do state laws get written? How do they get passed? Um, and sometimes it's dependent on something that seems very insignificant or random, and you need to know that in order to pass those laws. For, for corporations, it's obviously much different. Um, I was just at a conference where I had a college student say, you know, what would you tell the younger you? And what I would tell the younger me was don't sell widgets. Don't do public relations um, for things that aren't meaningful and purposeful to you. And I can say that, you know, my outlook on my life, my outlook on the world has changed significantly since doing something that is so incredibly meaningful and purposeful to me. Take me back to December 15th of 2012. Uh, I can remember that I was hearing the news come in over my phone, watching it come in over my TV, and frankly, it was just sort of a, another shooting, right? I mean, that's kind of how we all feel when we see this happen in America now, and I thought, well, please, you know, this is an elementary school. Don't let this be as horrific as it sounds like it is. And what I think we all quickly realized was that it was worse than we ever, ever could have imagined. And that when, you know, 20 children are slaughtered in the sanctity of an elementary school in a developed country, um, it, it, it was shocking. And I can remember thinking, you know, my country's broken. Because I, I lived in Texas when, if you guys remember, the Luby's mass shooting happened. Um, and then, you know, Columbine. And then uh, Virginia Tech and Aurora and all the shootings in between. And shame on me, frankly, for not getting involved sooner and not realizing that actually 91 Americans are shot and killed every day. So several Sandy Hooks every single day in this country. But I just remember being not just sad and devastated, but incredibly angry that it was happening. And then, obviously, the call, the, the first thing I saw was uh, the call on the news from some for the solution being more guns. And uh, just was enraged. And mom's main action was born. It was. So I was a stay-at-home mom of five in a suburb of Indianapolis. 
Uh, I was not a social media phenom. I had 75 Facebook friends. Uh, I have quite a few more now. And I thought, you know, what can I do from my house? And I went online and I thought, well, there's got to be a Mothers Against Drunk Driving for gun safety, right? Someone has to have already started that. I'm just going to plug in because as a mom of five, that's how this speaks to me. And I couldn't find anything. And I thought, well, I'm just going to start a Facebook page <laughs> and see what happens. And I did that. And what was so amazing was the outpouring of interest, of likes, of people calling, you know, finding my number online, finding my email online, and reaching out to me and saying, how can I get involved? This issue speaks to me like that too. And I always say that. This isn't my story. This is a story of millions of type A moms and now dads and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles who want to do something that will save American lives. And how are you going to do that? Well, we, we started working on it right away in three different ways. So the first way was to go after Congress. If you guys remember, just months after Sandy Hook, we tried to pass a law that would have closed the background check loophole. And for context, 40% of guns, we think, in this country are sold every year without a background check. That is millions of guns that are getting into the hands of dangerous people like domestic abusers and felons and criminals. You know, imagine that you are in a TSA line at the airport and you can go through security or not go through security. You know, if you are a dangerous person, which line are you going to get in? And that's the line they're getting in for guns in this country. So we thought, well, you know, surely Congress will do this. This is low-hanging fruit, right? We can save so many lives by just doing this. And, and they couldn't do it wouldn't do it. And I thought, okay, well, there goes Moms Demand Action. You know, that, you know, if we can't even do this, then, you know, maybe it is hopeless. And what happened after that was so amazing was that it was so clear that we had bridged the intensity gap finally in this country because we had more donations and more interest in the 24 hours after that bill failed and more people getting involved and saying, it's, I realize now I have to get off the sidelines. I cannot just sit by and hope that my lawmakers will do the right thing to protect me because they're not going to. That's clear now. And so what we did was immediately pivot to the states. And we first went to Maryland, and our moms helped uh, Governor O'Malley pass sweeping gun reform legislation in that state. In fact, uh, that's where stroller jams were born. So our moms would pack the hallways with baby paraphernalia. If you guys know, you have a lot of stuff when you have a baby. And there was so much stuff that lawmakers couldn't get by without answering our questions. And so we started calling those stroller jams, and we've had them all over the country. We trademarked them. We have a very smart trademark uh, volunteer. And it really, the state work was born. And, and that's the message I really want to impart to everyone, which is we are winning. We defeated 64 bad gun bills last year by showing up. The gun lobby has always been able to flip a switch and generate outrage, emails, calls, meetings, people in the hallways. We can do that now, too. And, you know, there's nothing worse than a really angry mom and, like, hundreds of them uh, when you're trying to pass a bill that is going to endanger their lives or their families' lives. And so we defeated, an, the NRA called their own legislative and agenda, agenda a train wreck in an internal email last year. But we're also playing offense. So we have passed background check legislation uh, in six states since Sandy Hook. So now 18 states in the country have gone ahead and done what Congress won't do. They've closed their background check loophole. We are getting ready to do it in Nevada and in Maine in November. That will mean 20 states have closed their background check loophole. More than 50% of Americans will live in states that have closed their background check loophole. So we are sending a strong cultural signal, much like marriage equality happened in this country. We are showing Congress the direction the nation is headed in and that they need to, to catch up. And one other way um, that we have attacked this that I think is unique and, in, and interesting to moms is that we have gone after companies and sort of involved them, you know, with or without their desire to be involved. Um, as you can imagine, they don't really want to get involved in something that's become a polarizing issue. About six months after Sandy Hook, I saw in the news that Starbucks was going to outlaw cigarettes and electronic cigarettes 25 feet outside of their stores, regardless of state law. 
When I called them, they said they were still going to allow open carry in the 44 states that allow that. I don't know about you guys, I'm much more scared of secondhand bullets than secondhand smoke. I, I don't know, it just seems logical to me that I don't want to stand next, in line next to someone who with a loaded AR-15 getting my latte who may not have had a background check or any training. So we, you know, this group of, we were only six months old, we launched this campaign. Within three months, we got the CEO of Howard, uh, uh, Howard Schultz of Starbucks to come out on national news and say, guns are no longer welcome inside our stores. And we knew we were onto something. We could pull the lever of making the majority of the spending decisions for our families. And we have done that. We've replicated that at Chipotle, at Target, at Sonic, at all the Brinker restaurants, uh, recently at Trader Joe's and at Fresh Market and at so many different retail outlets. We just got Facebook and Instagram to prohibit private sales on their platforms, which will save so many lives. So we have been going after this at a state and corporate level, knowing that it is just a matter of time till Congress does the right thing. And I wanted you to talk about how you were able to do these through social media. And that's the power of this, is this, these campaigns skip Saturday for Starbucks and the burritos, not bullets and, uh, and, and, and the things. So talk about that side of it, the power of the social media side, but also there's a flip side to it and the negative side. And it's how personal the attacks have been um, on, on you and others that are doing this work. So some people deride hashtag activism as though it isn't a valid form of protest or you know, using your First Amendment rights, and I would disagree vehemently with that. I mean, if you have a baby and you're putting your baby down for a nap and the only time you have during the day is to send a burrito, not bullets tweet, um, we know it works. In fact, burritos, not bullets was our hashtag for the Chipotle campaign. We got them in one weekend to flip from allowing open to carry to saying no guns in their stores. So hashtag activism does work. And you know, I always think like, how did Mothers Against Drunk Driving even do this? Like, did they drive to each other's houses? <laughs> and then did they call each other on the phone? There's a phone, send, there's a phone tree. Send a letter, yeah. you know, join me. Um, I, I, what they did in, without social media is astounding. I think what we have done has been turbocharged. And the reason we have been so incredibly successful is because of social media. Um, but there obviously is a downside, and that is, I mean, you can go online and Google me. I won't be doing it, but you guys can Google me, and uh, you'll see all kinds of hateful, horrible, vile things. I mean, there is an underbelly of America that I did not know existed living my, you know, relatively quiet life in Indiana. And that, I, I really believe that gun violence prevention activists, particularly women, get it worse than any other issue in this country. I mean, I know for sure. And it isn't just online, it is also offline. And so, you know, we have rallies and marches and we're often surrounded by men, almost always men, who are open carrying. And they are trying to intimidate us. You know, we have our children and our families and we are simply trying to fight for something like a background check. And they have loaded AR-15s and they're trying to silence and intimidate us. And so, you know, I, I don't know of many other issues in this country where the opposition is openly armed. Uh, but, you know, this happened recently in Kentucky. Our moms had a welcome event. As you can imagine, it's not very welcoming when you see 12 men come in the door and sit in the front row with who were open carrying, which is perfectly legal in public libraries in Kentucky, by the way. And our moms, didn't skip a beat. They put pins on those men and they said, if you're going to sit here, you're going to listen to what we have to say. They took pictures and selfies with them. And, you know, I, I think what we and I and so many women and mothers in this country realized after Sandy Hook, and again, shame on me for having it take so long, what we realized was that if we lose our children, we have nothing left to lose. So we won't be silenced or intimidated. Um, it, it just, it's, it's background noise at this point. When did it turn so toxic? I would say one hour after I started my Facebook page. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, uh, I started to get texts. My, my public phone number was somehow findable at the time. I started to get texts, I started to get calls, I started to get emails. Um, I, I started to have people drive by my house. Uh, I eventually started getting letters at my home and my children uh, were harassed and their Facebook pages were taken down. And I mean, it has just been a complete 
bizarre experience, and I'm very grateful to my family for being so strong and never having wavered. Um, but, you know, this, I, I think this change that we're seeing in this country, I mean, it's just testament to the fact that we're winning. People don't get so outraged and angry and mean unless they are afraid. And they are afraid that the gun lobby is losing its grip on this country. And, you know, th that's, that is the fact. And so I think we'll continue to see that. But eventually, we will look back on this time in our country and say, wow, that's those were the laws? We let that happen? We let 91 people die of gun violence every single day in our country? And if that's, you know, what we have to suffer to get to, get to that point, then I think the members of our organization would say that, that that's, that's what will happen. This is one of those issues that you can't even agree on numbers. One side will say that that 91 deaths is not, you know, whatever it is, whether it be 91 deaths, whether it be the number of school shootings, whether it be the number of deaths caused by guns, whether it be the number of bullets that takes, that more guns do equal less crime, or whatever it is, this has gotten to the point where even talking about statistics, we can't agree on either side. So if we're at that point, where is their common ground? Well, I would, I would actually disagree with that statement. I, I actually believe there is a common ground. 90% of Americans don't agree on anything in this country, but they do agree we need to close the background check loophole. 75% of NRA members, and this was done by a Republican pollster, 75% of NRA members actually support stronger gun laws. So there is common ground. There is absolutely consensus. What we have that is causing so many uh, blockades is an incredibly intransigent, um, extreme gun lobby. And no other nation has that. This is a gun lobby that makes up their own facts, that makes up their own data to serve their purposes. And make no mistake, that purpose is to make money. That is it. It is to feed profits of the gun manufacturers. And so when you talk about data, I mean, the gun lobby has worked very hard to chill all research done by the CDC and other organizations on this issue. So, you know, we have stepped in. We have an amazing research department at every town um, that helps us get the data we need to actually have a factual conversation. And so, you know, I, I, I think that there absolutely is common ground in this country. What we have a problem with is that the NRA has become so prevalent in our state legislatures and in our Congress that they are afraid. And we have to show those lawmakers that we have their backs and that when they do the right thing, they will keep their job. That, that's all it's a matter of. I mean, when we take this to the people and we bypass state legislatures like we did in the state of Washington, where we did a ballot initiative, it passed by 60%. It was the lawmakers who had been standing in the way. And that's why in Maine and Nevada, we're doing the same thing. We're doing a ballot initiative. Now, that costs a lot of money. It costs millions of dollars. Thankfully, we have that now. And we can fight the NRA toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe where they have never had that kind of opposition before. Talk a little bit more about the Facebook, Instagram, um, and, and how much of an impact that really is. We started on Facebook. And you know when we got into the data and understood that Facebook was really becoming uh, a primary way for dangerous people to get guns easily, you know, to basically have conversations to say, hey, do you want a gun without a background check? Let's arrange, let's meet. Um, they were becoming almost, you know, as prevalent as armslist.com for, for encouraging these private gun transactions. And so we started a campaign uh, just months again after, uh, actually about, it was February, the year after Sandy Hook. And we started this campaign about you know, the fact that this was happening and just educating women and moms about this. I mean, minors were getting guns that way. Domestic abusers were getting guns. And we were very grateful that within just three months, Facebook said, OK, we're going to put these nine policies in place that will do things like prevent children under the age of 18 from seeing gun sales. We will have pop-up language that talks about background checks and what your laws are in your state. That was great. We applauded them. We thanked them. We continued to have conversations with them for two years. We showed them research about you know, how people were getting their hands on guns on Facebook. They had to make a crucial decision. They were becoming more of a commercial platform that actually sells products. And two years, almost to the day, 
that they first put those nine policy pl positions in place, they came out and said, we will no longer allow private gun sales on our platforms. And again, it just sends such a huge cultural signal. Um, people don't necessarily see the overlap between business leaders and lawmakers, but I can remember the day after Chipotle happened, the first question then Governor Rick Perry got on CNBC was, what do you think of the Chipotle decision? So they are all intertwined, and we're incredibly grateful that Facebook has done the right thing. And for the, as I think I saw an article, socially responsible gun owners, what is your message to them? Well, the majority of gun owners are incredibly responsible, and it is this vocal minority. You know, we have this new movie out. You guys go see it. It's called Under the Gun. And it was created by the Katie Couric's team, the same team that did Fed Up. And they actually ask people outside the NRA convention. Uh, they have an annual convention, and this one uh, was in Indi Indianapolis. And they said to them, what do you think about the fact that the NRA supports gun sales without background checks? No, I don't agree with that at all. What do you think about the fact that the NRA supports gun sales to uh, suspected terrorists on the watch list? They can't fly, but they can buy a gun. What? That's insane. What do you think about the fact that the, the NRA has gone to the Supreme Court to fight for domestic abusers to have the right to keep their guns? So when you break it down, responsible gun owners don't agree with that at all. And in fact, only 5% of gun owners are NRA members. But this needs to become an issue that people actually vote on. We want to make it one of the top voting issues for women. It's, I'm now a single issue voter. I don't know how I can worry about education and health care when I don't know that my kid's going to come home from high school. But we need responsible gun owners to stand up and say that they, you know, support stronger gun laws. Um, in fact, we have a program also, if you go to besmartforkids.org, it's very apolitical. It is all about how do you responsibly store a gun? You know, just yesterday, a four-year-old was in this back seat of his car, took a loaded gun and shot and killed his mother who was driving down the highway in Wisconsin. What other developed nation does that happen in? No other developed nation. And the reason is because we have such easy access and lax gun laws in this country, only 28 states hold adult, adults accountable for safe storage, and most of those states consider that a misdemeanor. And it also goes back to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. So if you remember the 80s, I don't know if you do, but I do. I was itty bitty. <laughs> Basically in the 80s, you'd get in your car and you would drive drunk and you would kill your family. And people would say, that is so horrible. That person has suffered enough. We cannot possibly punish them. And then Mothers Against Drunk Driving came along and said, wait a minute. Laws are the moral underpinning of our society. If we don't have a law that says this is bad, then it's going to keep happening. Flash forward to 2016. If I'm in Colorado and I leave my loaded gun on my kitchen counter and my 15-year-old got it and shot your son, people would say, what a horrific accident. That woman has suffered enough. We can't possibly punish her. And so we have to agree as gun owners and non-gun owners that we value human life and that the onus should always be on adults, not children, to make sure that children aren't around unsecured guns. Two million children in this country live around live in homes with unsecured guns. And so there is that common ground. And, and I do think, you know, we've had a lot of responsible gun owners come into the fold. A lot of our moms are gun owners. So this is not anti-gun. It's not about being anti-Second Amendment. It is simply about strengthening our gun laws so that we can save lives. You mentioned the um, four-year-old that shot a parent. I don't, I didn't see it. And it's not that I, I I was choosing my news yesterday. It's just that I think that that's not a news story anymore because it happens so frequently. Um, and so how does this, how do we quit desensitizing things that if it were any other um, event, 100 people dying a day would be pretty important coverage? Desensitization is a real issue on this. You know, I was talking about Sandy Hook. My son... I can remember when the news came in, I thought, well, he, I've got to make sure he doesn't see this because he had seen when the Aurora shooting happened in Batman and he actually went to the movie with his sisters and fled the movie. Like he had a panic attack because he thought everyone was armed in the movie. You know, his security bubble had been breached. And then when Sandy Hook happened and I had to figure out how to tell him, he was, 
He didn't even react. He's like, yeah, that's what happens in America. And I think that it's really dangerous for anyone to have that attitude and to think that. I mean, honestly, that is what the gun lobby wants us to think, that this is the price of freedom. And it isn't, and it isn't normal, and it isn't acceptable. And that is why, you know, I'm going to make my mom's demand action uh, cry right now. Moms, members in the audience, raise your hand. Find one of these lovely people and get involved. You know, it's, it's, it's as easy as sending an email, making a call, sending a tweet, taking on a leadership position would be great too. Um, and, and, you know, one other thing I want to talk about, I mean, this, is, this goes to bridging the intensity gap. Uh, we have an annual gun violence awareness day called Wear Orange, hashtag Wear Orange. And it was started when, if you guys remember, Hydea Pendleton was shot and killed shortly after she marched in one of President Obama's inauguration marches. And her friend said, we want to remember her by wearing orange. That's the color that hunters wear to say, don't shoot me, I'm a hunter. And we took that idea and made it a national campaign. And so on June 2nd, it will be our second national day. Uh, you will see celebrities wearing orange. You will see skyscrapes across the country, skyscrapes across the country lit in orange. You will see athletes wearing orange. You will see lawmakers wearing orange. You will see so many people getting involved. I mean, we are just already blowing this out of the water. It's another non-political way to say there are too many gun violence deaths in this country. There are too many gun suicides. There are too many gun homicides. And I think that just by joining that, becoming a part of that movement, um, and starting to talk about what is gun sense. You know, it isn't a radical idea. It's actually about safety, and it isn't taking away anyone's rights. Um, so all of those things, getting involved in some way, does help with this desensitization. It shows people that they can act and win and create change. I have one more before we open up for questions. Um, how do you work yourself out of the job? When is success? <laughs> Well, I'm a volunteer, um, but I, you know, I, I really believe that you will see this country close the background check loophole on a national level within the next five years if we act, if every one of you in here joins the Arkansas chapter, for sure, we can get that done. Um, but I, I really do believe that this is much like marriage equality, which you know my kids think happened overnight, but it was years and years of activism on the ground, people changing corporate culture, people changing, legislation at the state level, and then finally, you know, Congress, most of them anyway, saw the direction the country was going in. Um, I, I really don't think it will take as long as the gun lobby wants you to think it will take. And, you know, in the meantime, we're going to keep passing background check legislation. At the state level, we're going to keep passing laws that keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. We've gone into states and done that in, in more than a dozen red and blue states. Um, and, and it is about drips on a rock and keeping this going and never giving up and not feeling like it's hopeless. And that is the message the gun lobby has sent out for years. The best thing you can do to solve this problem, they say, is to get a gun. And we actually know that the data shows that's not true. The data shows that when you pass background checks, you cut police homicides, domestic homicides by gun, uh, suicides, gun trafficking, in half, almost in half. And so we know these laws work. If you look at a state like Missouri that had great gun laws and then reversed them, homicides and suicides by gun spiked almost immediately. So these laws work, and uh, you know, as soon as we can continue to, to fight that at a state level and at a congressional level, then my job is over. I hand it on to a millennial. That's the plan. We just passed the baby boomers, so we're, we're, there's lots of us. So we're going to open it up for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. Behind you, Julie. Julie, behind you? Yeah. Hi, my name is Hillary. Thank you so much. This has just resonated with me so deeply, so thank you for being here. Um, I do have a question about engaging in conversation. I'm not from the state, and when I moved to the state, I'm, I don't own a gun. My family did not grow up with guns, and I started dating a man that was a hunter. And just in our relationship, having conversations about safety and about guns, um, 
he's brought up a lot of defensiveness. Um, so just, you know, we struggle and we, ha we are in a relationship and are required to talk about it. So I'm curious, <laughs> how do you, um, in your experiences, how have you one-on-one -on -one engaged with um, some people that potentially come to the conversation with some defensiveness up that might think you're trying to take away my gun when really that's not the case? Well, some people will believe when you say that and some people won't. And I think, you know, Guns have never been confiscated in this country. I mean, they've been saying Obama's going to confiscate people's guns for eight years. He has a very short amount of time to get that done. He has 300 million guns in the next 200 days. Um, you know, I, but I understand what you're saying. I mean, look, this isn't about hunting. This is about uh, easy access to guns in a weak gun laws. And if you had the conversation, it would be interesting to know, you know, this idea of did you know that background, that guns are sold, millions of guns are sold every year without a background check. Did you know how easy it is for a domestic abuser to get a gun? Um, you know, it'd be interesting to know how that conversation went, but there is a, we actually just had a campaign called Singled Out, which you should Google, and it's all about talking to young women about how to have that conversation with their dating partners. Uh, do you own a gun? Why do you own a gun? How did you get your gun? Because what we're seeing is that as women wait to marry, dating partners are becoming the majority of victims of gun violence now. And when you look at what is considered um, a domestic abuser that cannot have a gun in this country, the federal definition is really just your spouse or ex-spouse. It's not a dating partner. It's not a stalker. And so that's why we've been going into states and tightening these laws. Um, but, you know, I, I sympathize with you, and I understand, and I thank you for continuing to have that conversation. I mean, it's, it's one boyfriend, one lawmaker, one company at a time. We'll get there. One of the arguments would be slippery slope. And so yeah. if you regulate that, so maybe what's, what's the answer to that question when slippery slope is the... Well, you know, again, these laws work, and, and there's no one that is talking about undoing the Second Amendment or confiscation or taking away anyone's rights. I mean, in fact, you know, the Heller Supreme Court decision says you can regulate the Second Amendment, and that is what we're talking about. We're talking about just strengthening many laws that are already in place. I mean, background checks are already required on licensed sales. So if you buy a gun at Walmart, you have to have a background check, but if you go buy a gun at a gun show, you don't. So this is just common sense. We know that the Brady Bill that requires licensed dealers to sell guns have saved lives, millions maybe, of lives. So the slippery slope idea is something the NRA wants you to believe. They want you to believe there's chaos at your front door. I mean, in fact, that's the cover of one of their recent magazines. There's chaos at your front door. Um, and, and they just want you to th you know, think that you can't even go to the grocery store without your gun. And that is because, you know, uh, fewer people are buying more guns. So the NRA's demographic is an older white male that is literally dying off. And so they have to sell more guns to other people. They've convinced that demographic to buy a lot of guns, right? You need five AR-15s, you need seven Glocks. But what you see them doing now in order to sell more guns is to market to women. And that's why toddlers are getting their mom's guns, right? Bra holsters, uh, holsters in your purse, you know, things that aren't safe storage. And they are trying to force guns on college campuses right here in Arkansas, too. And that is not a public service announcement. That is a craven marketing ploy. They want to make guns normative around your children so that that generation will then buy guns. And so, you know, I think that, that it's just incredibly important to say the slippery slope is actually guns everywhere. The slippery slope is that everyone thinks they need a gun at all times. Johnny. Um, I was inspired by something that happened uh, last month at a library after church to get a concealed handgun. I grew up around guns, and I respect what you're saying. I, I went to a concealed carry class earlier this month, and there's two questions I have about this. One, I'm in favor, of course, of the, what you're saying about the closing up. But I guess what I'm asking is... Um, do you, would you support a don't be a victim class? And also, too, would you think it would be good to charge these people that have guns that shouldn't? Because obviously they're going to give them somewhere. If they don't have an education class, like a hunter education course, 
or the all-day class I had to go to earlier this month? No, it's a great question. And, and as I said, we are not opposed to gun ownership. You know, if a person wants to have a gun in their home and they feel that it's going to protect them, they have every right to do that. What you do see across the country is incredibly lax training and licensing requirements by depending on the state. I mean, some states you can just go online. It's nothing to get a concealed carry license. So, you know, we think that those should be strong, that there should be training. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think that we disagree on what you're saying at all. I mean, I think we're in the same place. Hannah? After. I'm Anna Strong. Um, I'm a graduate of the Clinton School, and I work at Arkansas Children's Hospital right down the street. Um, I wanted to ask, kind of give you a, a, some insight on some local statistics we've recently um, discovered, which um, we, we do a community health needs assessment every three years as a hospital. All nonprofit hospitals do this, where we go out and talk to our community about fears and about things that they see um, as areas where we need to improve the health of the people we serve, which in our case are children across the state of Arkansas. Um, we asked a question this year. We asked about unsecured guns in homes, and we found that 41% of gun owners who responded to a telephone survey keep their guns unlocked in their homes here in Arkansas, um, which represents about 18% of all the people that were surveyed, which to me is, is utterly frightening. Um, and we also know suicide is, is the second leading cause of death for our adolescents, for kids over age 10. And the two of those facts together, to me, really speak to the need to do something. But as you know, here in Arkansas and in the South, that can sometimes policy doesn't happen overnight. Um, policy change doesn't happen overnight. What are some things that you would recommend in the short term for us to do um, to help combat this very stated fear that families are expressing of mass shootings, of things happening like this, combined with the fact that there are so many unsecured guns in our state? Well, first I would say that that, again, is part of the gun lobby's marketing strategy, right? So they sell the most guns after a mass shooting because they want people to believe that they are at risk. Um, and then they also, in many of their trainings, uh, suggest that you do actually keep your guns loaded, unlocked, and at the ready because they want you to sort of be fearful because then you'll buy more guns. Um, so it's really sort of a vicious circle. But there, you know, there are several things. First is Be Smart, which is the program we talked about earlier, BeSmartForKids.org. It's incredibly important. I mean, we last year we did more than 500 educations in house party situations in people's homes, through the PTA, uh, through physicians' networks, to talk to people about what is responsible storage, and that is keeping your gun locked, unloaded, and away from ammunition. That is the best way to store your gun. And it's having those conversations. Um, obviously, we would love to, to partner on Be Smart. I just spoke at the PTA annual convention. And again, it's something everyone can agree on for the most part, which is we need we have a responsibility as adults to protect children. Um, you know, the other possibility, you know, we're seeing some states pass child access prevention laws so that people are held accountable for more than a misdemeanor if someone gets, if a child gets a hold of their gun and hurts themselves or someone else. But suicide is a horrific problem in this country. You know, we have the same admittance rates um, for, for suicides, we have the same suicide attempts as, as other developed nations. What we have that is different is actual completion rates because guns are so incredibly deadly. You know, a 15-year-old boy who decides he's going to kill himself and takes pills uh, is a lot more likely to live. And th what we've seen from data is they don't do that again, right? They get the help they need. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision, and it doesn't happen again. You don't have that ability when you shoot yourself with a gun. So uh, suicide is a horrific problem in this country. And again, it goes, it speaks to easy access. I mean, I keep going back to the gun lobby, but they have worked very hard to keep physicians from talking about this issue. In Florida, they've put a gag order on pediatricians. So pediatricians can, they can ask about pools and seatbelts and smoking, but they can't ask about guns. And they've also put a gag order, or at least they did, it's been overturned, but to keep military personnel from talking to soldiers who, may have a gun, and, and who are such high risk of committing suicide with a gun. And so, you know, the, the gun lobby is doing everything they can to prevent any kind of safety. And, and it's on us to reverse that. Right here, Bob. I have a minor question with a major preface. Uh, I believe the corporate 
approach you take is fab fabulous. Uh, I heard someone mention cigarettes. I've often believed that one of the reasons we have cigarette ban is not the laws, it's not the way that the legislatures all of a sudden woke up and decided to fight this tobacco industry, but it was because corporations said, oh, it's in our interest to do it too, and all of a sudden people went and governments went, oh, okay, we'll, we'll pass laws. In your issue, uh, you mentioned two corporations doing it, and my question is, again, Dink, uh, is twofold, which is, I believe one of the great approaches your organization should take and, and is taking is convincing corporations in the United States that it's in their interest. So A, as a supporter, do you make public these companies so that I can go into these companies and when I purchase something say, I'm only here because you support this, and B, what other corporate efforts are you taking to approach the private industry on this issue? Yeah, so a couple of things when you were talking about tobacco. The, the very interesting thing about tobacco is actually the gun lobby watched that very closely, and they learned, and they went to Congress, and they got them to pass immunity so that the gun lobby cannot be sued. Manufacturers cannot be sued for marketing their products in effect, or inappropriately. So we need a new president and a new Congress that will reverse that. In terms of companies, yes, if you go to momsdemandaction.org, you can see a list of more than a dozen companies now that have done the right thing. Um, we actually just put out a Mother's Day brunch, if you want to know where you can go, that has responsible gun policy, shop for groceries. Um, we have gotten so many grocers to do the right thing on this issue, uh, except for Kroger. So anybody know what Kroger is called in, in Arkansas? It's Kroger. Kroger. Okay. Don't shop at Kroger, but it, it, I know, but you're going to have to go to somewhere, Costco or something. Um, oh, uh, Sam's, Sam's. Okay. You may have to grow your own gardens, I'm sorry, but, but, but Kroger, you know, is sort of the cheese stands alone. It's one of the biggest grocers that we're still working on to change their mind. Under the gun focuses on Kroger, so, so check that out and see how, that you, how you can act. But, you know, there's nothing to stop you from going to your own local stores and retail outlets and asking them, what is your policy and what signs do you need to put up? I think a great example of this is actually in Texas. We have an amazing, fierce chapter in Texas. And they just became the 45th state to allow open carry of handguns, believe it or not. They did allow long gun open carry. Now they allow the open carry of handguns. So immediately after that passed, our moms started going door to door and canvassing businesses and saying, here's the huge sign you have to put up to prohibit open carry. Here's the huge sign you have to put up to prohibit concealed carry. And how many businesses now, Jamie, 500? More than 500 businesses in the state of Texas have listened to our moms and put those signs up. Not just the open carry sign, they actually have also put up the concealed carry sign. So we saw online one NRA lobbyist said, we wish we never passed this damn law because now we can't take our guns anywhere. We thought we were gonna be able to open carry everywhere. So it really does work and you know, all politics is local. So if this is important to you guys, hook up with our Arkansas chapter. You mentioned the immunity. Isn't there some movement on that? recently with the Sandy Hook parents? No movement yet. Uh, they've been talking about, it's become a, you know, the, the interesting thing about this election is how much guns are factoring in. So if you guys remember in 2008, uh, both Democratic candidates, when we got down to choosing one between uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, they were both, they didn't want to talk about this issue. They did not want to have this discussion. It was too controversial and polarizing. Flash forward to 2016, I mean, Hillary Clinton's giving us front row tickets to every single event she holds. She calls out our moms. Uh, she's made this a wedge issue. And I absolutely and firmly believe she's gonna fight for it in the general election. Uh, last night, several pundits said it's why she won so many Northeastern states, including Connecticut. So, you know, this is, this is becoming something that's acceptable to talk about among lawmakers. There's one right here. It's coming behind you. I have so many questions, it's difficult to narrow it down to just one. Um, I guess, being from the South, I feel like the culture of fear is 
greater than it, it might be in other states, other areas. Um, and I'm kind of a black sheep in my family. It's difficult to talk about guns, even, I mean, until I'm blue in the face and I'm like, my daughter, you know, we need to protect our children. And they're like, oh, we'll hand them a gun because that's great. Um, so how do you feel like, what do you feel like the number one way to combat that culture of fear would be? Like, if you could come up with just one solution to that and like, I know we have to have those discussions constantly and consistently, but um, what would you say would be the number one way to do that? Well, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's a culture that if we buy into it, we're going to have the status quo, right? So at some point, we have to decide. I mean, you know, I didn't step out because I thought it would be really a great, fun idea. I stepped out because I didn't want to lose my children to gun violence. So some of it is taking that risk and deciding that that's more important than anything. But I think you would also find that we have this incredibly safe and secure culture within Moms Demand Action. So we aren't just local. We are also all on Facebook together. We get together frequently to do trainings across the country. There's such a safe landing among moms who are having the exact same issue you, that, that you are. I mean, we have chapters in Oklahoma and in Texas, in both Carolinas. I mean, we have a chapter in every state of the country. But it isn't easy to talk about this in Alaska. It isn't easy to talk about it in Colorado. Um, but it is about getting the strength and support of other people, learning how they did it. You know, we have, a, a, I'm friends with one Texas mom who found out that every time she went to her in-law's house, they were leaving a loaded gun in like a little box on a shelf where the kids were sleeping, right? And just assumed the kids wouldn't be able to get it. And there were several weeks of estrangement after she basically said, look, if my kids are going to visit you, you're going to have to keep your gun safely stored. And, you know, that was a lot of discussion among us all as an organization giving her support when the family was saying, this is how we live and why are you trying to change that? Um, so I, I feel for you, I understand what you're saying, but I would also say, you know, sometimes it takes being uncomfortable to change things. I'm not sure uh, if this is true with homeowners insurance, but I pulled it on my neighbor, so maybe you know. Uh, live in a street with covenants with small acreage, bullets travel far. Uh, neighbor knows we're, uh, I, we were talking about this, that I'm anti-gun, very much so. We don't own a gun, but my husband's retri a retired army infantryman, so he obviously knows how to how to how to carry and use a weapon. And he said, "Well, what would you do if someone shot on your property?" I said, "Well, if I caught, if I know who it is, I'm going to take him to civil court and sue him. I don't even know if that's possible, but it seemed to work. And I know." Most people that have a mortgage have to have homeowner's insurance. And homeowner's insurance don't like risk. And I just wonder, um, with people having homeowner's insurance and you're injured by them shooting a weapon, is it even possible to file a claim or take them to civil court? And some of these people, to be frank about it, wouldn't have enough money to hire an attorney because they're so mortgaged up to the hilt. So just the thought of a frivolous lawsuit in civil court see, might keep them in check. I don't know. But the other thing was about the homeowner's insurance. That might be a way to get to people in the uh, pocketbook. Yeah, we've actually done a lot of research and have thought quite a bit about homeowners insurance. And again, much like smoking right now, very few policies ask that question, make of an issue of it, hold people accountable. Um, we do think that you know holding people financially responsible will change the culture. Um, so yes, that's something that we've talked about and discussed. Uh, in terms of, of free flying bullets, it depends on your state's laws. Uh, I don't know specifically about Arkansas. I can guess. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I've met so many survivors of gun violence through this work. And one of the women that I met, uh, her husband took her twins to a shooting range in Nevada. And uh, a, a gun 
you know, was discharged in the wrong place at the wrong time and shot and killed one of her twins. And there's absolutely no penalty. No one was held accountable. Um, and, and again, it just speaks to sort of the, the lax laws in this country and lax uh, access to guns and who has them and how they're used and so many preventable tragedies if, if we could just figure that out. Right here, one more up, one more up. Um, I'm a stay-at-home parent of a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so you can imagine how much free time I have on my hands. But I'm interested in doing, like, I know you said internet stuff, Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing, and as well as having conversations, which I had a difficult conversation with my father over a period of months when we moved in together and forced him to buy a gun safe. Well, actually, I bought it for him, but now he keeps it in the gun safe, and that's all that matters. But beyond that, I mean, what can we do in our copious amounts of free time while toting around small children that wear diapers to, to exact change, because I don't mind dragging them down to the Capitol, but that doesn't seem particularly realistic. So what can we do? You are in the exact same position as the majority of our members, and they are effecting change, so it can be done. Um, we have a great video by a mom who uh, was put her baby down for a nap and said, here's how I call a member of Congress, because that's pretty intimidating. I had never called a member of Congress before moms, and she taped herself on her phone, picking it up, calling her member of Congress. What she said, you could tell she was so nervous, hung up, she's like, that's how you do it, right, during nap time. So, you know, if you, you know, these ladies aren't gonna let you out of the room now, so, you know, uh, <laughs> When you become a mom's member in Arkansas, it, it really is up to you as to what you can and can't do. But we have so many campaigns right now. The Kroger campaign is hashtag groceries, not guns. We have wear orange. Um, there are different ways to get involved in that. And you know, it really can be as easy as we will send you a text when you become a member if there's something happening. You know, My understanding is that Next year, the gun lobby will probably come in and try to take away the opt-out language that allows universities to opt out of guns on campus here in Arkansas. So we will need you to make phone calls to your state lawmakers. We will need you to send tweets and to send texts and to post on Facebook and to educate other people. And there may be a couple times it would be great if you could take your kids with you to the state capitol because we need to fill the room. I mean, yesterday, or the day before yesterday in Minneapolis, we are trying to get uh, the legislature to pass background checks. 300 moms and survivors showed up. 300, do you know what an amazing impression that makes on lawmakers? The lawmakers said, we haven't had anybody here for any issue, that kind of a crowd. And that is bridging the intensity gap. So yeah, there may be times it would be great if you could come to the state house, but a lot of this work is networking and using social media and reaching out to people and getting them involved. We've got time for one more. Uh, Shannon, my name is Kim Zimmerman. I, um, I'm not originally from Arkansas. I moved back here after being in the military and that sort of thing. But I grew up with an uncle that liked to hunt, and I learned to hunt, and I was pretty good at it. Um, I've always been pretty comfortable around guns. But one of the things that infuriates me about this whole thing with background checks is um, you hear people talk about, well, you know, you shouldn't be worried about the guy you see in the grocery store that's open carrying because, you know, he's had training, he's got a concealed carry permit or something like that. It, when I was growing up, you know, the guy who had a co concealed carry permit was like a jewelry store owner who had to make deposits after, you know, closing time and that sort of thing. So, but I've seen, I'm not trying to disparage you, but um, I, I've seen a lot of people since since all this stuff has sort of come to the forefront, I've seen a lot of people say that they're doing more concealed carry classes. Here in Arkansas, you know, we took money out of education budgets to um, fund getting teachers certified in, uh, you know, uh, active shooter situations and that sort of thing. Actually took money out of that and put it into arming teachers in schools where schools you've never heard of, I mean, and likely will never hear of, statistically, will never hear about, you know. So it infuriates me that when I hear about these concealed carry permits, and I know for a fact, I know people who have gone through concealed carry classes who never had to fire their gun, who literally, literally 
got their concealed carry permit, and never fired a gun. Now, I fired a gun many times in several different kinds of guns. I can't even imagine it. Um, I, I think I've been really well trained, and, and yet I don't want to be the hero of the group who says, oh, stand behind me because I got my gun, and it just drives me insane. Um, I'm wondering if there's, I don't think that there's any, to my knowledge, there's no consistency at all between states about the requirements to get a gun uh, under concealed carry, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, to get a concealed carry permit. And I'm wondering if that's an area that you guys have explored at all. I am also active on Facebook and on Twitter about this issue and have been for a long time, so I applaud you for that. Thank so. you. A responsible gun owner who's also a member of Moms Demand Action and who, you know, is what we're talking about here, the average American. Um, first of all, there is something called concealed carry reciprocity that the gun lobby is trying to pass, which means you could get a concealed carry license and then take it into any other state using the lowest bar necessary, right? So the least common denominator for getting your concealed carry permit would apply to any state. So any state that had strong laws around concealed carry would then have to acquiesce to whatever. So, I mean, that's the deal in America, right? You're only as strong as the state next to you with the weakest gun laws. So California has great gun laws. Nevada has horrible gun laws. Um, so, yes, I mean, and that is all part of the NRA's deal where they say, you know, you're going to be able to be the hero and you're going to stop every single shooting that there is and yet that does not happen, right? Um, in, in Aurora, there was a, a guy who's a concealed carry, he had his license, and he said, there's no way in hell I could have stopped that shooting. We were ambushed in the dark in a theater. I would have killed more people. Um, but, and you were talking first about open carry in grocery stores. I want to be really clear that almost all of the 45 states that allow open carry require no background check, require no permitting, require no training to do so. So let's say you go online, you meet someone, you get an AR-15, you don't have to have a background check to open carry in most states. So, you know, I don't know why the onus is on us to figure out who the bad guy and the good guy is. Uh, you know, the, the bad guy in the Gabby Gifford shooting walked around that grocery store for quite a while, open carrying guns before he shot and killed several people. So, you know, it, 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 and, you know where I live in Colorado, um, in Colorado Springs recently, there was uh, a woman who called 911. She said there is a man open carrying down the street, a rifle. They said, ma'am, that is perfectly legal in our state. She called back five minutes later and said he just shot and killed three people. So it, it is absurd. It is the definition of insanity, and it should not be acceptable. It should not be the status quo. I don't think many Americans realize that this is legal and that this is happening. And so that's part of, of what we're doing is educating people about what, are, what insane gun laws our nation has. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for coming to the Clinton School. Thank all of you for coming out this evening.